The French called it bread or, the arm of gold. It is a small inland sea, open at both ends and occupying the center of Cape Breton Island. When the Scotsmen came, they cut back the forest to make room for the farms and used the wood to build their boats. The boats were strong, but the land wasn't much good. The settlers moved on, leaving the forests to grow back to the shores of Bredore. Now there aren't too many boats and not that many people, but some won't go. One is a certain Morris Watson, known to his friends as Scoggy. I don't think I could stand to live in a place where I couldn't see the water. I think I'd just go crazy. It's almost like a, a fever you get to, just to get out there on the water. You have to, you'd have to be able to just be determined to stay here and, and stick it out and, and maybe work a little harder than you would if you, if you went to a big city where you get a softer job. Boats. That's all that went out of my head till I was about 18. Probably stayed a kid longer than most people did. I turned on. It should go again. At one time, you could see a hundred sailing ships a day go by. His father and his grandfather built them. It is a natural craft of Bredore. The Kennedy brothers have been doing it about as long as anybody can. One was supposed to be 87, and the other is 93, I think. The older fellow refers to his brother as the, as the young fellow. And for, for people that age to be doing that kind of work, it's hard to believe. For Scoggy, the Kennedys are not just curious old characters, but fellow craftsmen. Well, I just hope to be able to do half the things when I'm 93 that are even 87 that they can do. Most people are, are dead long before that. It would be a shame for them to pass away without uh, passing a lot of their knowledge along. And you two are going to start on another boat in there, eh? Huh? Did you start on your other boat yet? No, no. You got, uh, no. You got some material gathered up. Oh, yes, we got yeah. some material, but... Yeah. Oh, I can't work there anyway. Come on, ordinary, hard-working people. That's my kind of people. Down to earth people, people that I can figure out, people that you can talk to and, and listen to and, and don't mind, don't mind them. You still intend to build a boat this winter? I got the keel and the, and the stem and things started on it. You have? But uh, I didn't put her together yet. No? I might. But now, is you a big boat going good? Oh, she's, oh she's you've got good. a dandy. You made a great job, boy. You don't need anybody else to build for you. You can, well, do, <laughs> you can do it yourself. <laughs> I don't know about that. Oh, God, that, you if, made a great if job. You, uh, Everything is taken up so nice. <laughs> if you're going to be working on that boat this winter, would you mind if I drop in and have a look now and then? Yeah. Well, would sure. that be all right? That would be good, yes. I could uh, maybe learn a little bit. Yes, well, you, you know... When you built that boat and the way you fixed everything up and masts and everything, you've made a great job. <laughs> ah, God, nobody could I do better. I should have taken you fellas out for sale. Nobody could do better. I want to go and learn from you. The year he finished school, Scoggy Watson worked through a winter building his boat. He had no power tools. He even sewed his sails by hand. I've always puttered around with some woodwork and ever since I was a little kid. And I, I knew that I had to have a boat of my own and there was, there was nobody else around that had built it for me without charging me plenty of money. So I, I just had to build it myself. And uh, 
It, it turned out plenty solid, and I had uh, uh, all kinds of fun with it. It's not really classy or fancy or anything, but I had more more enjoyment out of it than than most uh, anybody else around. I think uh, with their fancier boats. When he was making the sails, he got so good at sewing that he made himself a pair of trousers and a couple of shirts for good measure. That was when he was 18, and now he's 27. His friends thought he was crazy, those friends that were left. Most of them had given up on Lake Brador and headed for the mainland. Sometimes you, you meet a girl that you, that you think a lot of, and. Uh, she, she can't stay around Cape Breton because she has she can't get work around here or something like that or she can't get work in her field and and you, you get to, to think a lot of her and she has to leave here that's happened quite a few times where they, they they find that they just can't they just can't stay around here and they have to leave and then sometimes go back to the big city or something like this that's that's one disadvantage of Cape Breton that the, they can't hang around here One morning, when Scoggy was 14 years old, a wondrous great sailing ship appeared in Brador. The ship was an exact replica of the boat that Joshua Slocum had sailed single-handed around the world back at the turn of the century. It was manned by a mysterious stranger who had built it by hand. He would rig it out maybe once a year, set sail for a day or two, and then return to anchor. I kind of think you might have in the back of his mind to, to sail, uh, sail around the world like Slocum did. And uh, he either gave up or got scared off from the idea. I used to be on his heels all the time watching him and watching how he, he worked. And he'd, he'd sometimes take time off from work to explain things to me and point things out and recommend books that I could read and something that could help me out. Or, very powerful man, uh, in great condition for his age. And he doesn't look that old, but he, he's around 60, I think. He's probably about the only hero, that, uh, a real hero that I ever had when I was growing up. The stranger always talked of weighing anchor and sailing away, but so far he had stayed for 13 years, and he was still at the center of Scoggy's life. Well, just a, just a, a terrific guy, an all-around great guy uh, that uh, kept to himself pretty well and wasn't trying to um, impress anybody or show off to anybody or anything like that, and kept clear of parties and, and drinking and women. He, he's, his death on women, I don't know whatever uh, discouraged him. I never got a chance to ask him, but he doesn't seem to be too enthused uh, about women. And a great sailor. A real, a real sailor, not one of these phony, fakey yacht club members that'll, that'll sit in the yacht club and drink beer all the time and never go out in the water. He's a real, a real seaman. No, I've been told throughout my life to leave and look for more. Ah, but what more could I ever have than a life on Lock Prudor? Oh, even though. It may be hard, and it's what I've always longed for. Here we go now. I didn't want to leave it, I guess, and, and was just determined that uh, I wasn't. I think what happens to, to a lot of the kids growing up, uh, they, uh, they get pushed into college whether they want to go or not. And uh, they'll go to college and they'll specialize in something, and. Uh, uh, they get this specialized feel and they get uh, a bunch of letters after the name and, and they have to go somewhere else to get a job where they specialize in a certain field and around Cape Breton you, you don't get that many jobs. So they have to, they have no choice, they have to leave Cape Breton to get the, 
the, the, the right work that they've been studying for for years. They, they're not trained to do anything else. They couldn't stay around with Breton and, and start a farm or start a maple syrup industry or something like this. They, they, they studied all their life on the, on the kangaroos in Australia or something, and that's where they have to go, move somewhere else. That's why a lot of them have to go anyway. Opposite of them, I didn't have to specialize in anything. I just uh, tackle anything and, and take what would come along and loved Cape Breton enough so that I could stay here. And, uh, I don't see any reason to leave as long as I'm able to get a, a bite to eat now and then. I will, even though it may be hard, it's what I've always longed for. So what more could I ever have than a life on long? In the ten years since he left school, Scoggy has always had some kind of a job. Right now he's tied up with a government outfit trying to develop marine farming on Lake Bredeau. It has already created a hundred jobs and kept a few of Scoggy's friends from jumping ship and heading west. I think the Bredores is the largest inland saltwater lake possibly in the world. We have everything that you have out in the ocean, but it's all protected water. You don't have any fearsome big high seas and, and big waves rolling around. Deep water, too, a spot where it's 900 feet deep. Because the, the, we have the salt in here, it makes it possible to grow oysters and mussels and uh, trout and salmon and. Uh, anything you'd have in, uh, anywhere else. There's nothing that I can think of that's out in the ocean that isn't in here. One of the operations is an oyster farm. Newborn oysters will settle on any submerged surface. In Bredor, they lower strings of scallop shells. The oysters that land on them will stay for life, high above their natural enemies. In the warmer, cleaner water, they will survive and mature more rapidly. When they're big enough, they're shipped out to cooperatives, where they reach market size within three years. Uh, I was just uh, trying to get rid of some of the mussels here, these little black fellas here. They're the uh, enemy of the oyster, and they're, they're pretty well coated on some of the shells. But when you get the mussels uh, cleared off, you can see some of the small oysters that we caught just in the last two months. They stick real good, and the, the mussels are you can, you can brush them off. The mussels come right off. But the oyster is stuck. It's stuck on pretty firm. There's quite a few on there you can't see, too, from there. There's a few. Those two stick in to me. Scoggy is now a foreman on the project, and for the first time, he is in charge of other men. When I started there first, so I was scared. It's stiff. I was always in a very self-conscious school, very shy, fearful shy. Having to, to look after a crew of people, that, uh, that helped my confidence a lot. Uh, trying to organize people, working together. I find that kind of interesting. I never had anything to do with it before. But... have a look if I can get this thing out of the water. I don't know if I'm strong enough. It's very heavy. These are these are two-year-old oysters that we raised in here. Maybe I can just lay them down here gently. That's very, very heavy. I wonder if a kink in that so won't lose everything. Underneath all this mess there's a there's a scallop shell. You can just see the edge of the scallop shell there, and that's the way they'll cluster around on it. Push each other out of the way. There's just a fearful, fearful bunch of oysters on there. And they're only two years old. Some of them, some of them bigger fellas measure over four inches already. 
three inches market size, but actually they're they're long enough to sell, but they're so thin, thin through this way, that you wouldn't get too much meat out of them yet, because they're only two years old. But they just give you a rough idea how they do grow in here. I'll just hold it up, maybe you can better look. There's a few meals on that string now when those get to be, when they get fattened up a bit. They make a meal for quite a few people and make some money for us, maybe. Cape Breton, our maritime oysters are supposed to be tastier than oysters that have gotten elsewhere. It's almost pioneer work, growing oysters in the Bedour Lakes. There's no reason why we can't get every second Cape Breton are working on this, uh, right in front of their doorsteps, and because there's a lot of people live on the Bedore Lakes. And there's, there's no end to the, the chance of developing the lakes here. And uh, it'd be a great thing uh, to get another industry in Cape Breton, because they, they certainly need it. The Cape Bretoner, long cut off from the mainland, has developed a talent for improvisation. A man's cows, for example, can be put to pasture on an island. There's lots of food, and you don't need a fence. The man driving this boat invented it for work around the oyster rafts. He then realized that he could also use it to carry his cows. His name is Gordon McRae, and in a land noted for its ingenuity, he is considered something special. In his own way, he's probably a genius among people around here, anyway. Probably a lot closer to genius than, than most people. No matter what he comes up against, he can come up with some kind of a, a solution and, and, and build it. There's no stump in them. You just can't beat them. Uh, for years and years, he'd worked uh, at carpentry work, and he'd be working with wood, and only wood. And that's all he ever worked with. No matter what you wanted built, a bed or a boat or a house, it would have to be made of wood. Since he came to Devco now, he's completely changed over into a different line and he's into aluminum. And now when you ask him to make something, no matter what it is, it's going to be made of aluminum. No matter what. If you want a, a blanket for your bed, he'd probably come up with an aluminum blanket. I think you find that in country, you know, you have to, if you want something, very often you have to do it yourself because there aren't that many experts in all the different fields to call on. Very often it's a matter that if you have to do it yourself or you just don't get it done. Gordon came up with this machine made up of, of scrap material practically just right out of his head, a machine that could punch scallop shells and punch them fast. You could go right around the world and you'd never see anything like it. A machine for punching holes in scallop shells to be used to catch oysters. The Japanese and the Romans did it 2,000 years ago, but they never had a machine like this to help them. Beyond question, there is nothing else quite like it in all the world. You can always leave if you figure that you can get a, a better living somewhere else. But if you do move away to the big city especially and then try to come back, it's a lot harder. Uh, you're in the rat race and to try and slow your life down coming back here, it, it can be pretty tough. Yeah. So I think it's a better policy to, just, to hang on here. and uh, You can always leave later on if you really have to. But I, I don't think I'll have to. I hope not. Anyway. When you we're living in a, a darn fine place here. We're hanging on the edge of the world, probably. We 
don't have to worry about uh, uh, tornadoes or, or hurricanes or air pollution or noise pollution or, or riots or killings or strikes. There's a lot of stuff we're, we're clear of down here altogether. We're, we're just geographically away from all of this. And it didn't get here yet, but it's moving this direction. Maybe we can stay clear of it for a while, though. There was never any need to go out in search of the world. It had always been anchored in the harbor. But one September morning, Scoggy Watson gets word that the wind is right and the mysterious stranger is rigging his sails. The wondrous ship is finally going to go. Pretty good, Scoggy, getting about ready to shove off. Let me take your line. Hmm? She looks to be in pretty good shape. Yeah, I got everything. I got everything. Everything painted, and Everything pretty well looked after this year. Yeah. Nice give little me, breeze coming. Give, give me your line. Well, I got it. It's a, it's a good sailing breeze, all right, but I don't know. I don't think we get through the bridge with this wind, though, unless it shifts. You just were ready to, to hoist, eh? Mm hmm. I gotta get the boat board first, and then. Oh, no. You don't need a hand with it. I guess you can. No, it. I can get it. I can get it aboard. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I was just gonna ask you if you thought it might be all right if I'd sail along for a little while with my own boat. Oh, if fine I with me. Fine with I'll me. I'll try and keep out of your way. Okay then. So I hope you have a, a good trip. Well, I'll, I'll see you sometime, Scotty, yeah. anyway. Maybe someday, if, if I was lucky enough, I might end up with something like him. But uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to compare myself with him, that's for sure. That's a pretty sight. Drift toward is born and blue. Wild walk the wall shadow. Two winds go riding by, riding by the lucky meadows on to the ring of day. Imagine the day he arrived that very few people would have seen. Not too many people know about his comings or goings. And that's the way he likes to have it. Just to be kind of an unknown altogether. If you give him a chance, maybe you come up with some of these dreams that he has. Save all from tumbling down, tumbling down to rock on. Pray, Mary, send him home. Safe from the foam singing. Kajil go. the dark oh. I will 
even though it may be hard it's what i've always longed for so what more could i ever have than a life on labrador